What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I'll be talking about lame deer, seeker of visions today. Hope you guys will enjoy this book review slash analysis. Uh, we blew through this uh, relatively short book, you know, maybe in the course of the last two or three weeks. It's a super easy read, uh, but it is pretty demanding. It, you know, it demands your attention. Uh, it's good to read it on, you know, as consistent of a basis as possible. I'm uh, going to be burning some sage here today for uh, in honor of lame deer himself. So just a little bit quick rundown on uh, John Fire Lame Deer. He is of the Sioux tribe. Um, now the Sioux, they don't really call themselves Sioux. They call themselves something else. Let's see if I, if I wrote it down here somewhere. Um, you can always Google it, but they have their own names for their tribe, right? They don't call themselves Cheyenne and Sioux and all that sorts, but they do have a, uh, a little glossary here in the back of the uh, book, which is really helpful. That can sort of explain the, uh, the Native American, uh, you know, ways that they describe themselves. So it's kind of slipping my mind at the moment. Uh, let's see here. Uh, but he is a Lakota Sioux. Um, and yeah, so there is an, you know, there is an actual Native American original name for that. Um, and I'm not an expert on Native American history or Native American language. So just take that for a grain of salt as we do this book review. Uh, but I definitely recommend um, John Fire Lame Deer Seeker of Vision, written by a man named Richard Erdos. Um, Richard Erdos was sort of a, um, he was actually an illustrator originally, and he lived in Europe and different parts of the, uh, all throughout Europe. I think he was part Jewish and part German, and he was kind of a, a melting pot himself. And he went on a road trip out into the Midwest. He was traveling all over America after he, you know, was trying to flee the Nazis or something, apparently. And he um, just fell in love with the landscape of the Great Plains, right? And then he was, uh, he had to do something. I forgot, him and his family stopped at this Indian reservation, or that's where they were, they were kind of hired to work there temporarily for some kind of, uh, I forgot what it was, sort of contracting philanthropy or something. Um, it's explained in the last chapter of the book. But anyway, he was introduced to, uh, you know, the Native Americans out there on the Rosebud Reservation or something similar to that. Um, now, John Fire Lame Deer, who the book is about, uh, he's now deceased. I'm not sure when he died, uh, but he was a pretty prevalent Native American activist, um, you know, social commentator. But he's also a medicine man. He's a Lakota medicine man. And at the age of maybe 12 or 13, maybe younger, the first chapter of the book uh, documents his vision quest. Uh, Lame Deer went on a vision quest when he was very, very young um, because he felt, you know, the spirits. He felt that energy from his heritage and his past that he really wanted to sort of take advantage of. And, you know, during, you know, he grew up in a boarding school. His mother died when he was maybe like nine or 10 or something. And then his father was kind of frustrated with him um, and just sort of how all the younger generation of Native Americans were kind of just all becoming white, you know, people or, or living a more white centered culture, I guess you could say. His father basically told him, if you want to live like a white man, you know, best of luck to you. But uh, we're parting ways. Um, and so John Fire Lame Deer had a very, very tough upbringing. Um, so the first chapter kind of documents um, Lame Deer's sort of spiritual awakening, right? His first vision quest. Um, you know, he talks about, uh, I remember reading this, this first chapter when I was really, really young. And I really wanted to go on a, on a, on a vision quest. Uh, of course, I didn't have a spiritual guru. And, you know, that probably would have been pretty reckless for a, a, a little kid like me to go without food or water for four days and four nights. But it would have been cool, and I am planning on doing my own vision quest just here in my bedroom um, for four days eventually at some point. Um, I might just, I'm going to close the door and just have people, you know, bring me maybe a little little tiny bit of water just so I don't die. Uh, but you can pretty much survive without water for at least a couple of days. I'm not sure if it's wise to uh, go without water for four days and four nights, but I guess it's possible the Native Americans did it, so what the hell. Uh, so by the time we get to chapter two, we start getting into the, the history of the Lakota and he sort of describes, uh, you know, his, his heritage and his relatives um, that fought in the Battle of Wounded or the, um, the, the, the Custer Battle. What's the name of that battle? The battle at, 
I can't even remember the name of it now for some reason. But, you know, that big battle everybody knows about with Custer, right? So they fought against Custer. Um, he's talked that the, the second chapter is called that gun in the New York Museum belongs to me. Now, what he means by that is that the gun, you know, according to Lame Deer, the gun was originally owned by his great great grandfather that, you know, fought Custer, fought the soldiers at Custer's. Um, you know, so, uh, and he talks about how his, his grandmother, when he was growing up with his grandmother, the Native Americans on the reservation used to make this real, real thick coffee. And he says by the end of the day, you know, the coffee was so strong, you could like stand a fork or a kitchen knife just straight up and down. Obviously, he's exaggerating, but apparently it, the Native Americans like their coffee, so that's pretty cool. He also talks about how he was forced to go to boarding school and all that kind of stuff. Made him cut his hair. He was forbidden to speak his language, forbidden to practice his beliefs. Um, now, I will say that um, the sort of the overall uh, uh, contextualization, the contextualization narrative of Lame Deer is sort of the, um, the not the noble savage, but sort of the wise noble um you know, maybe victimized, perhaps, Native American, right? Which is true uh, to a certain extent, but it's also not true. You know, the Native Americans are, are very complex uh, sort of, um, you know, animal on their own. They're a very complex species, just like anybody else. Um, they had their own problems even before the Europeans or the white men or the settlers or the conquistadors came. You know, they were fighting each other. They were hurting each other. Obviously, they lived much more in balance with their... Uh, surrounding environment with the other tribes members but I'm sure there was you know a corruption among Native Americans in, in ancient American history um, but so going back to the narrative of lame deer here kind of what we have is we have that we have that sympathetic uh, sort of you know looking back into time looking back to sort of the noble wise Native American medicine man and sort of how they were overtaken and overpowered by the white settlers, right? The railroad killed off all the buffalo. But at the same time, Lame Deer is not, he's not anti-white. He's not anti-Christianity. He's not anti-anybody. Um, he pretty much loves all of humanity. And the central theme of Lame Deer um, and, and John Fire Lame Deer's sort of worldview is um, the Lakota tradition of, of a, lo a lot of different plains Native Americans had the, the sacred pipe. That was the peace pipe, right? You know, we saw everybody smoking the peace pipe in Peter Pan. Of course, that wasn't very accurate. Um, and they used this for religious purposes. They weren't like, you know, sitting around smoking tobacco all day. Uh, they do it for the spirits, and they call their great spirit uh, Wonka Tonka. Um, and whenever they say prayers, you know, like in Christianity, we do the Lord's Prayer or something like that. But they do, um, they have something that they say that, that's called uh, Madaku Ye, which means all my relatives. Um, and all their relatives basically mean all their family relatives, all the animal relatives, all the relatives of humanity, the earth, the sky, the nature, you know, the fires, the floods, everything. Native Americans, they pretty much believe in, in everything. Um, they don't really have a real central, you know, like a Christ figure, perhaps, but they do. I guess the equivalent of that would be Wonka Tonka. Now, they do have a lot of other characters that kind of come up in their mythology and in their religion that are important to kind of, um, you know, keep tabs on or just be aware of. Um, now, Lame Deer also goes in, into a uh, real far in depth about the Native American uh, creation history among the Lakota um, and sort of what they you know, what they think and how they raised uh, boys a little bit differently than women. There's some beautiful passages here about, um, you know, a, a, a young Native American girl getting her ears pierced is a real sort of profound um, a moment in a young girl's life. And Lame Deer sort of was being rebellious and he pierced his own sister's ears. Um, and his father was very upset about this because Lame Deer was not the one that was supposed to do that, right? But Lame Deer was kind of going astray a little bit. And then his father or his grandfather, I think it might have been, um, said, you know, you might feel, you know, real cocky about this now, uh, but eventually you're going to pay for this. And then eventually he made him give up his car. He took his car away um, because he had betrayed, you know, his own Native American tradition. And we see, uh, I wish they had a better picture of Lame Deer in this. The original version of Lame Deer had a ton of photographs in the middle of the book, but for some stupid reason they didn't include him in this. 
Um, they just kind of have this really great painting, but it doesn't really look quite like them. Uh, but anyway, so William Deere is kind of struggling in his early life uh, between, you know, what it means to be a Lakota Native American. He, was, he wants to be Indian, but he's also being forced to be white. You know, he's growing up in poverty. He doesn't really know what's going on. Um, and he did, uh, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, was in control of all the reservations back then, right? I think it's it's a little bit different now. I think most of the Native Americans have been granted, you know, independent amnesty or whatever over their own lands to a certain extent, right? So we have that. We have sort of the conquering, you know, a lot of this, you know, Lame Deer Seeker Visions takes place, uh, sort of, he, he traces his heritage sort of, you know, all the way back to the Battle of Little Bighorn. That's what we were trying to think of earlier with Custer. That's as, about as far back as he can go, maybe a little bit farther. But then, you know, he talks about Wounded Knee, you know, where Chief Blackfoot or Blackfeet uh, was kind of, you know, gunned down with all of his tribe members. And you definitely see the plight of the, the U.S. government um, trying to basically exterminate um, are pretty darn close to exterminate and sort of, uh, you know, overpower the Native Americans. Um, now, Lame Deer's uh, Sioux name or Lakota name is Tonka Ushte. So I did want to just kind of announce that Tonka Ushte, Lame Deer uh, in Lakota. They don't call themselves Lakota. I wish I could remember the name of that, but it's neither here nor there. So he's talking about the gun in the New York Museum belongs to me. And he's talking about how, you know, a lot of the museums and sort of the American culture appropriate and sort of falsify Native American history, right? So that's, you know, he's saying that gun belongs to me and my family, not not you all. Uh, so chapter three, by the time we get to chapter three, three, we have this theme called the green frog skin. Now the green frog skin is sort of the metaphor for money, right? The Native Americans did not have money. They don't understand money. Sure, they maybe had some sort of trading or some sort of um, monopoly to get things, uh, trading between tribe members and stuff like that. Uh, but he talks about sort of the evils of the green frog skin, the money world. And he talks about how, you know, sort of European American white culture, I guess you could say, is very money driven where everybody's in a hurry. Everybody's living in a skyscraper. Everybody, we've kind of lost touch with reality, with nature. Um, but he does go in depth quite a bit about Christianity. And he said, Moses, you know, Moses went up on a mountaintop and received visions and came down, you know, in the Old Testament. He said Moses would have made a really great Lakota warrior or like a Sioux medicine man. So Lame Deer is not living under a rock. You know, he's very aware of European religion and history. Um, and he, you know, he talks a lot about the slaves. So he's aware of, you know, sort of the African-American plight. Um, but we sort of the modern, you know, postmodern social justice sort of agenda in, in our American modern times is real focused on the plight of African Americans, right? Police brutality, slavery, uh, redlining, stuff that they still face today, unfortunately. But everybody forgets about the Native Americans, and I think it's pretty tragic. So by the time we get to chapter four, if anybody should be upset, it really should be the Native Americans, not, not the African Americans. Of course, they have a reason to be upset too. Um, but chapter four is called Getting Drunk and Going to Jail. Um, lame Deer starts drinking. And in Sioux culture, we have something called counting coop. Now, counting coop, I think I'm pronouncing it right, was sort of an act where the young, rebellious, sort of masculine warriors would sort of ride up to their enemies, whether it was other Native Americans or, or army soldiers, and they would just kind of wave a stick at them. Like we, he did that in Dances with Wolves. I think Kicking Bird did that uh, when um, John Dunbar, Kevin Costner's character, first meets uh, the, 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 the Sioux. I think they're either Sioux or Cheyenne and, and Dancing with Wolves. I can't remember which. Pretty sure they're Lakota. But anyway, um, so when he's kind of shaking his stick and kind of screaming and laughing at Kevin Costner, that's counting coup. And it was a form of, of showing your courage, not her harming your enemy, but you would sort of intimidate them and just go and tease them a little bit or whatever. They did it during buffalo hunts, and that's how they would warm themselves up in order to muster up the courage to sort of fight 
battles and stuff. It's called counting coop. Now, um, getting drunk, going to jail, chapter four is kind of about, um, he, Lane Deer uses that metaphor of counting coop um, to sort of, um, as, as a metaphor for why he went out and he started stealing cars and he started drinking and he was so frustrated and just so depressed and so disillusioned. And he was his, he was watching his people sort of vanish, and he was forbidden to um, live his own culture. Um, so his way of kind of counting coop and sort of you know keeping the heritage going uh, with with that was kind of going out and stealing cars and just kind of being reckless. He didn't hurt anybody or anything, but he was kind of counting coop in modern times. He was kind of getting that you know tribal sort of uh, mischief out of his system, right? So we have that. And he goes pretty far into depth about, um, you know, the bad diet of Native Americans. He said the Native Americans used to live with a full set of teeth into their 80s and 90s and beyond. And then when they got, you know, kind of put on reservations and the army, you know, put them on alcohol and lard and all this really bad stuff for them. Um, and they were half the time they weren't even sending them very good rations, just a bare minimum. Um, so you can definitely see, um, and we need to talk more about Native American history. We need to talk about more about Native Americans and not so much focus every, all the social justice stuff on, you know, just, um, black Americans. Obviously there's some room to be had there as well, but everybody forgets about the Native Americans. Um, so chapter five, I'm kind of going through the chapters here because the, the book is definitely set up in a manner for you to, um, you can kind of hit up one chapter at a time. Um, sort of um, independently. I mean, obviously you want to read the whole book, but if you want to go back and touch upon certain subjects that you resonated with, uh, the chapters are real specific. Chapter five is about sitting, it's called Sitting on Top of Teddy Roosevelt's Head, you know, the Mount Rushmore thing. And he talks about how, you know, they were sort of uh, the American government or whoever designed it um, was sort of exerting their power, their authority over the land, which is not what Native Americans really believe in at all. And he talks a lot about the artist. He actually met up with the with the sculptor that made the, uh, you know, the uh, the sculptures out there in Mount Rushmore. I think it's called Chapter Six. Um, is called the Circle and the Square. Now I kind of forgot what that was about. But I think in this chapter, he goes through a complete rundown of how Native Americans uh, present their symbolism. They have these symbols. They did have some form of written language. This is it. Um, they represent various different things. Um, you know, a lot of it makes sense. You know, they have a little image, a quite endearing art of somebody smoking a peace pipe, uh, joining of hands. You know, so they do have some form of a written language, despite what's been told. Uh, so he, this is all about that. He talks all about their written language. Um, really cool stuff like this at the bottom of the page there. Um, and how they sort of interpret symbols. And, and they tell stories. Native American history was told through stories. They didn't really write a lot of things down. But they did have sort of a written um, decorative sort of way that they presented things. Chapter 7 is called Talking to the Owls and the Butterflies. This is about um, the Native American sort of tradition of just really absorbing nature, getting out into nature, listening to everything. Um, and when I was real young, you know, I used to do that. This book inspired me quite a bit. And I still listen to the animals. But as you get older and, you know, you get kind of corrupted by society, it's hard to hear the animal voices. Lame Deer says here, Americans want to have everything sanitized, no smells, not even the good natural man and woman smell. Take away the smell from under the armpits, from your skin, rub it out, and then spray or dab some non-human non odor on yourself. Stuff you can spend a lot of money on, $10 an ounce, so you know that it, you will smell good. B.O. Bad Breath Intimate Female Odor Spray. I see it all on TV. Soon you'll breed people without body openings. So, um... You know, he says, I think white people are so afraid of the world that they created that they don't want to see, feel, smell, or hear it. Now, when he's saying white people, you know, it's a kind of a limited term because what does he mean by that? Does he mean German? Does he mean French? Does he mean English? Does he mean Italian? Does he mean Greek? You know, and Lame Deer is actually quite white himself. He actually doesn't even really look like an Indian, uh, but I, I'm assuming, you know, apparently he is a full-blooded Sioux. 
Um, so he's talking about how sort of the American culture, European culture, whatever, um, they want to sanitize everything. They want to, you know, they, they, they want everything factory farmed and prepackaged, you know, TV dinner. So he's, he's kind of going into a full, um, I annotated this whole section, just not really annotated, but kind of circled it. Uh, cause he goes into these real funny sort of descriptions of how he's disgusted with the American diet and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, we, what else do we have here? So he's talking about that. And then he interviews this guy called Pete Catches, another Native American activist. Uh, so that's kind of what that chapter is about. And then um, chapter eight, we sort of get into the intimacy of the Lakota Indians. And he said that Lakotas are very kind of shy, almost prudish people. They're very loving. They're very affectionate in certain situations, uh, but they don't always show their sort of sensual desires. He talks about how when you're growing up in a real small, um, you know, cramped house on a reservation or even back when they lived in teepees the man and woman would have to kind of just make love and get it on whenever they could even if they had their kids in front of them and stuff uh, but he talks about how the native americans almost forbid incest they were not incestual at least this tribe wasn't kind of hard to believe uh, but chapter eight is all about the romantic sort of um you know ideology or agenda between native americans um, and then by the time we get to chapter nine, Lame Deer starts talking about, you know, he, he all the time he's talking about his own, um, you know, he's a medicine man. He talks about how he never took money from people. And he said that, you know, if you have that power, um, you won't lie about it, you know, because if you do, you know, the, the dark spirits will, will come back to get you. So if you have that power, you need to use it for a good, for a good faith and for a good source. Uh, chapter nine, good medicine, good and bad, is about. He talks about um, Native American sorcerers. Uh, there's a lot of bad medicine men, but most of them are pretty good. Um, um, you know, he talks. He, he goes into in depth about what all the symbolism of animals mean. Uh, they have uh, sort of bear uh, medicine men. They have deer medicine men. They have elk medicine med men. They have coyote medicine men. All kinds of stuff. Um, chapter 10 is called Inipi, Grandfather's Breath, and that is sort of a metaphor uh, for the sweat lodge, um, the Inipi, the sweat bath. Um, we do this because we always purify our, our, ourselves in the sweat house before starting one of our ceremonies. Whether we celebrate the sun dance, a vision quest, or the Inipi, uh, the Inipi comes first. It could be that the Inipi was our first rite that all the other ceremonies came after. Or came later we have an old tale which makes many of us believe that this is so and he goes into the ancient history of the sweat lodge i've always wanted to do a sweat lodge um but it's hard to you know meet somebody that actually knows how to do it i guess you could try to do it by yourself but you might be kind of dabbling in something you don't really know now chapter 11 is really interesting kind of creepy there's something called the uwipi ceremony where basically a man a medicine man they cover him in a blanket. He's, he's completely covered. I don't know how he survives without suffocating. And they put him in a room. They turn all the lights off. And they pass the peace pipe back and forth. Um, you know, uh, and, and out of this utter darkness comes the roaring of the drums, the sound of prayers, the high-pitched songs. And among all of these sounds, you hear uh, your ear catches the voice of the spirits, tiny voices. Uh, a blackness which cuts you off from the everyday world. They're basically, it's kind of creepy. They start shaking their rattles. They're doing drums. Um, and he does talk about, this is what you experience during a Uwipi ceremony. Uwipi is one of our most ancient rites. Some people say that it is not so old, but they are wrong. Their belief stems from the fact that Uwipi is never mentioned by the name in the old books about Indian religion. It could remain hidden from outsiders. Um, I remember my grandmother told me about the Uwipi when I was still a small boy. Um, he talks, I'm trying to figure out exactly what Uwipi is. Um, all the main features of today's Uwipi ceremony are described here. The stones, the darkness, the tying up. Uwipi, like our sacred words, has many meanings. Uwipi means to bind and to tie up. Uwipi is our wor word for the tiny glistening rocks we picked up from the ant hills. They are sacred. They have the power. We put 405 of these little rocks into gourds, which we use in our ceremonies according to the number of our green relatives. Uopi Wasokan, that is the power of the sacred rock. So you, the Uopi ceremony is basically the power of the rocks, the power of the earth, right? Uh, it is also another name for Tunka, our oldest god. 
Uh, so maybe that could be a derivative of Wonka Tonka, I'm not sure, uh, who was like a rock, old beyond imagination, ageless and eternal. The ancient ones worshiped this guy in the form of huge stone painted red. The old world for God and the old word for stone are the same. Uh, Tonkashila, grandfather, uh, but it is also a name for the great spirit. The world Tonka is in there. A more modern word for rock is Inyan. Uh, so he's talking about sort of the symbolism of rocks and these ancient rock gods. Um, the UOP ceremony, uh, you know, pretty it's pretty interesting. It's pretty creepy. Um, said the UOP ceremony, the spirits and the lights dwell in the stones. Um, the UOP ceremony starts when someone, a man or a woman, has a problem and needs help. It's almost like voodoo, right? Uh, that someone could be sick or he could be looking for a lost relative. He sends a peace pipe loaded with bull durham to a UOP medicine man. If he does this in the right way, the medicine man cannot refuse to help him. He must perform the ceremony. Not all medicine men are UWIPI. Some don't want to be. Being a UWIPI involves finding something. This could be a missing person, dead, drowned at the bottom of a river. Uh, if Uwipi finds him, he brings, brings uh, grief to the family or that something could be a stolen article. The Uwipi finds it and everybody is embarrassed, the thief as well as the medicine man and the man who asked him to search for it. Some medicine men shy away from this. I myself used to practice Uwipi, but I don't do it anymore. I have passed beyond that stage, but I have taught a number of men to become Uwipis and I will teach more. So it's almost like a little bit of a... Um, a cultish practice among the Sioux, you're right. It's kind of frowned upon. It's a little creepy. Got these people shaking rattles. They tie the medicine man up in a blanket. Uh, you need a sponsor and a medicine man to have a Uwipi ceremony. The sponsor is the one with the problem, the one who needs help. It's almost like going to confession, right? Or, or an exorcism or something, right? Uh, there's no real fee for the medicine man services, but the sponsor is expected to provide the food. It talks about how they cook dog meat. They boil a dog carcass in this big cauldron and they eat it. Um, so the UOP ceremony is pretty in-depth. I'll, I'll leave some of it to the imagination. Um, and during the UOP ceremony, supposedly you start seeing these lights. It's, it's almost like specters or orbs. And they start seeing these lights uh, sort of from the other side. You know, Wonkantaka is sort of communicating to them uh, through the Uwipi ceremony. So moving on now to chapter 12 called Looking at the Sun We Dance. This is all about the sun dance. The sun dance is one of their most, uh, the Lakota Native Americans and also the Cheyenne, I think, may have practiced this. It was mostly located with, within the Sioux tribes or whatever, Lakota, um, uh, Dakota Sioux, all that good stuff. Um, so the sun dance, some people of you guys might be familiar with that, some people not. The sun dance was basically worshiping the sun, right? Almost like sun worship, uh, but it was not pain-free. They had to sacrifice. They would basically pierce their chest uh, a little above the nipple, I think, or maybe a little bit below. I think it was above. Um, that actor, uh, what's his name? The guy that played cloud dance and actually had scars on his chest from participating in the sun dance. But basically they would kind of hook ropes or rawhide or something to this pole. And the pole was very, very sacred. I think it was a piece of cottonwood or something, it might, something like that. Might've been different, but they would basically just dance until, dance all day long, I'm telling you, all day long, or sometimes for days, staring straight at the sun. I don't know how they did this without going blind or getting sunburned. Uh, but this tradition has been going on and on and on. It's one of their most ancient uh, ceremonies. And they blow on the eagle bone whistle. The eagles are real sacred to them. Um, to many people, uh, why we do this, uh, the sun dance is barbarous. Bar barbarous, savage, a bloody superstition. The way I look at it, our body is the only thing which truly belongs to us. What we Indians give of our flesh, our bodies, we're giving of the only thing which is ours alone. If we offer Wonkantaka a horse, a bag of tobacco, food for the poor, we'd be making him a present of something he already owns. Everything in nature has been created by the Great Spirit or part of him. It is only our old flesh, which is a real sacrifice, a real giving of ourselves. How can we give anything less? And he talks about how, you know, Christianity or, you know, modern people look upon the ancient Native American practices as very barbaric, but Christ himself sacrificed his own body and his own uh, you know, flesh on the cross. Um, 
you know, on the Mount Golgotha or whatever to, to, to save humanity. So it's not all that different. You know, there's a lot of similarities, and he talks a lot about Christianity in here and also other religions, but basically they dance and they dance until the rope breaks and they rip their skin. So they used to go into the muscle with bear claws or something. Crazy stuff, but it's, it's awesome. It's very humbling. Uh, so they basically dance until they collapse or they, they're bleeding all over the place, right? Uh, chapter 13 is called Don't Hurt the Trees. Um, that's kind of about, uh, I forgot what this chapter is about. I think it's about trees, but he also goes into um, uh, peyote. And he talks about how peyote kind of came about. Um, it's been around. The peyote practice was actually a, a sort of a Mexican Indian practice, you know, the Aztecs or something like that kind of started peyote. But later on, after, you know, the, the a lot of the Native Americans were forced on reservations, they kind of started taking peyote as a way to escape. And there's something called the peyote church. I think most anybody can really join it. You probably might have to know a Native American or something. Um, but the peyote was kind of lame deer, kind of became you know, sort of disillusioned, desensitized with the whole peyote cult because he wanted to receive his visions naturally, you know, in the sweat lodge or on a vision quest or uh, during the Uwapi ceremony or during the sun dance or something. Um, and Native Americans are real focused on dances. You know, they got the sun dance, they got the ghost dance, they got, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, so except, moving on to chapter 14, we have uh, Roll Up the World. Now, Roll Up the World was, uh, I believe, it's about the ghost dance. Uh, the ghost dance started in the southwest among the Utes. When the sun was dark and one of their holy men heard a loud noise like many thunders, he fell down dead, but an eagle carried him up to the sky. When he came back to life again, he told the people that he had seen God or the Great Spirit. He had been shown a new and beautiful land which the Great Spirit had prepared for his Indian children. It was covered with lush, high grass. It was the land had uh, been before the white man came, full of buffalo, deer, and antelope. It was dotted with many teepees. In it lived all the Indians who had been killed by the white man or by his diseases. They were all alive again in that beautiful land. No white man's things were allowed among them. No guns, no pots, no pans, and no whiskey. The, the Ute holy man came back to earth with a sacred knowledge. He had been taught things in that new land, a few songs and a dance. By singing and dancing, the dead Indians could be made to return to the earth together with the buffalo. The Ute medicine man began to teach the dance to his people. He had five songs, the first brought on mist and cold, the second brought snow, the third brought a gentle shower. Uh, <clears throat> it seemed to be the, the message the help the people have been praying for. So basically, there was kind of like this cultic, mysterious figure. I don't know if anybody exactly knows exactly who he was, uh, but this was about 1890, I want to say, maybe a little bit earlier, 1880. Um, but as the Native Americans, especially the Plains Indians, started to really realize uh, the trajectory that they were up against in terms of being forced off their land, um, all the treaties that were kind of ripping them off and stuff, there was this... There was this sort of a uh, Gnostic, you know, Ute. Uh, I think he was actually not a Ute, uh, but for some reason they called him the Ute Holy Man. He was actually, he clears that up in here. I don't remember where it is. I think he might have been a Paiute or something, but apparently according to this, he's a Ute. Um, but anyway, you know, I'm not an expert, like I said. But anyway, this he was kind of like a prophet. Now, he sort of came and he started telling the Native Americans as they were on their last leg, to start this ghost dance, you know, we can roll up the world, we can escape from reality, we can, uh, you know, escape the oppression. Obviously, it was to no avail. It was very, uh, you know, very tragic and sad, the ghost dance in itself, because they were basically dancing um, to tr to survive. They were kind of, you know, it was their last little hurrah, you know, so to speak, before they were really quite exterminated by the... Um, the American government, and that's what they were doing at the Battle of uh, uh, Wounded Knee with Black Chief Blackfoot and all his people, where they massacred him uh, because they thought that the Native Americans were getting, they were starting to become rebellious again, perhaps. There was this weird Gnostic, you know, sort of, um, uh, I keep forgetting the word, 
uh, this prophet guy that was spreading this 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 sort of propaganda, I guess you could say, among the tribes to, to dance, and they started getting together again. The U.S. government didn't like that. It was a threat to them. Uh, so they basically forbid the ghost dance, and the ghost dance was basically their last kind of um, collective sort of uh, compared to like you know you know modern day uh, Native American political uh, systems. It was kind of their, the the last old school sort of ancient uh, collective um, you know uh, endeavor of the American Indian tribes kind of coming together to fight their oppression, to fight their downfall, right? So we have the ghost dance, uh, which was a real important um, part of their faith, um, you know, during the, the Indian Wars in the 1800s leading up to the Battle of Wounded Knee, which in some ways was sort of the last little, um, you know, last stand of the Native Americans, you know. So by the time we get to chapter 15, the upside down, forward, backwards, ice, hot contrary. Now these are kind of like they're not medicine men. They're like um, they're like uh, comedians. Uh, the Native Americans have these sort of figures in their tribes or in their communities on the reservations that are sort of like comic relief, right? They they say yes when they mean no. Uh, they say up when they mean down. They do weird things. They'll you know drive with their feet or they'll just you know. They kind of play, they're like tricksters, you know, they're almost like coyotes, and they say that the, uh, they call them contrary men or something, and they kind of, uh, they provided, they they played a real big role, um, you know, not only in, in ancient American history, but obviously they played a big role to sort of alleviate the suffering on the reservations, um, you know, at the turn of the 1800s. And then he gets into some more, uh, animal mythology uh so and he talks about how native americans are very very funny people and that's something that you'll hear in this book is that's one of the first books that really brings a lot of humor to uh the native american culture and sort of their worldview this book will definitely have you laughing it'll have you smiling it'll break you into sadness but it'll put you back together again uh now chapter 16 we're kind of getting towards the end of the book here it's called blood turned into stone now this is i believe just sort of a um, and an old theology of uh, just American uh, Native American um, animal mythology and creation history. I didn't quite master the chapter. I don't remember exactly what it's about. Um, and then we have the epilogue, but uh, that's pretty much um, lame deer seeker visions in a nutshell. Uh, those are just sort of the main points. There's a lot of other good, interesting material in here. Stuff about women, stuff about men, stuff about culture, stuff about money, government, politics. Um, now, Native, uh, uh, Lame Deer, he's not a bitter person at all. He's a very stoic, sort of loving person, but he, he will call you out. He, he demands of you that you that you face yourself, you face your society. Um, and I think these are the kind of books that we need to be reading. You know, uh, you need to read things that are going to enlighten you, that are going to change you. Uh, so this is just a little rundown of just sort of the main points of what you'll get out of this. You know, you'll get Native American history, get stuff about their ceremonies, their customs, their personal life, their religion, their diet, their hygiene, their faith. Uh, it talks a lot about the similarities between Native American faith and Christianity. Talks about love, talks about lust, money, frustration felt by natives, but also the knowledge and the comparison they make to the European white culture or perceived white culture. Now, he when Lame Deer is talking about white people or Christians or whatever Europeans, he's kind of talking collectively. You know, he's not talking to me specifically. Um, you know, I could get offended by some of the things he says, right? But I choose not to because I'm not that type of person. I know what he's getting at. Um, he talks about Moses, right? He talks about the sweat lodge, the sacred pipe, Wonka Tonka, counting coop, uh, Sundance, ghost dance. And you sort of get this um, beautiful uh, worldview of the Lakota Indians, you know. And obviously not all Native Americans are the same, right? Uh, but they all sort of have at least from my understanding, their worldview is very collective, at least among themselves and even outside of that. You know, there was even a, uh, a passage here where they said that uh, perhaps the next, you know, great, uh, you know, Sioux medicine man would be a black man or something, or he might be a Chinese man or, 
he might be whoever. Uh, so um, beautiful book. I definitely recommend this. It's pretty easy to read. Nothing too complex. Like I said, I've been reading this since I was like in middle school or elementary school. My mother had this book on her bookshelf, among many other sort of esoteric history books. And I kind of took it down and just kind of, uh, it was one of my first experiences with the Native American faith and the worldview and the religion and, and uh, really great stuff. But reading it, you know, 25, 30 years later, I, I, I can, you know, I got much more out of it. Uh, so this is going to go back up on the shelf. Um, it definitely will require some rereadings if I choose to dip my toes back in that sort of world again. Um, but it was really great to get some Native American history and some Native American sort of uh, content uh, under our belt again. So I encourage you guys to read this. If you have any questions about John Fire Lame Deer, he's actually got some old footage of him on YouTube. Um, but you can just kind of pull him up on Wikipedia or read about him on the internet. But try to get a copy of this. If you can, get the old school copy. It was like white and there was a photograph of him on there. And like I said, they had some pictures in the middle. Um, and there were some different parallels, I think, that they drew uh, between the photographs in the original version that are missing from here. They had a picture of an old Indian woman whose face was so wrinkled, almost like the canyons of Arizona. And uh, they had the picture of the jail that uh, Lame Deer was, you know, kind of incarcerated in. They had pictures of, of Lame Deer's family members and stuff. So for some reason... You know, they kind of abridged all that out of this version, but still a great version. Uh, make sure you guys follow me on Instagram at Andrew Marlow Artist Official. Uh, send me an email to andrewmarlow22 at gmail.com. That's actually a better place to get a hold of me. I'm kind of doing an Instagram detox at the moment, um, which was definitely inspired by Lame Deer. A lot of my changes that I've made in my personal life are definitely affected by um and lame deer but also the bible too you know we're drawing a lot of parallels between different religions and faiths uh so thank you so much for watching guys it was a pleasure and i hope you guys got something out of it so we'll see you guys real soon